think South Africa is now no longer even one of the top three internet destinations in Africa. And it's all self-inflicted wounds. I think the basic reason is that the government is the main investor in telecom. And consequently, a lot of policies were shaped to maintain the telecom position. And it's cost the country dearly. So if you're an eye surgeon and you don't have broadband, you can't pull the latest clip of an eye surgery technique from Boston, where it's available for free, or if you have a, have a mine, and you can't pull geological data, which is quite rich, you actually suffer. So the fact that broadband doesn't take off in South Africa is directly a policy decision. It's the government protecting telecom, <coughs> and that protection is costing the whole economy dearly. We're really falling behind. Are you lobbying the government? I don't think it'll be very effective. The problem is <clears throat> the Department of Communications is both umpire and owner, right? So they own a stake in telecom, mm. the biggest stake, and at the same time they make the rules for everyone playing the game of telecommunications. It doesn't work. It's like imagine Arsenal, um, or m imagine the ref refing Arsenal and Manchester United, and he actually secretly has a, or even publicly, have a stake in Arsenal and he's at the same time the ref for the game. It just couldn't work. You, you cannot separate your instincts as an owner from your instincts as a regulator and it's completely wrong. What should very simply happen is the government should say, look, the entity that regulates telecom should be a different entity from f the whole telecommunications field, should be a different entity from the one that owns the stake in telecom. So for example, telecom could be owned by public enterprises and the Department of Communications could actually be the regulator. That would work but the current system doesn't work. Okay, let's move on to pay TV now. You said it's becoming a mature business, but what you seem to be doing is repackaging it in so many ways and coming out with different ways yes. of watching DSTV. Is that a sign that, uh, of what you just said, that the maturity factor is becoming uh, important to you and therefore you've got a box clever, if you like? Definitely. I think <coughs> TV as a whole is quite mature and there's some ominous signs that, for example, young people are watching less TV than their parents. And that's quite dangerous. Uh, what w I think is happening is that the internet is really invading TV. So when multi-choice looks at their competitors, they're not really scared of some sort of satellite-based competitor or some terrestrial transmitter. They're thinking about the internet. Disney is sitting there in California thinking, how do I access Africa? Do I need someone like multi-choice or can I go direct? And Netflix is sitting in the States and saying, I'd like to colonize Africa and so on. So virtually all the attackers are coming from the internet area. So what one of the biggest things MultiChoice has to do is to be the best at providing you internet-based movies, sport, the typical TV fare. But of course, I mean, this is like our next point, which is print. I mean, print yeah. uh, has, has fallen by the wayside compared to electronic media. Uh, the same thing might happen to television. It'll take a lot longer. But does that give you an opportunity to partner with some of the people that you've just spoken about? We already partner with them. So imagine um, we talked about Manchester United a moment ago. They're looking at Africa and they're saying, I'd like to <coughs> have my games displayed across the continent in as many forms as possible. Who's the best partner? And MultiChoice is a good partner because they, um, and they actually have six million homes connected to the system. And Manchester United has a wonderful asset being a game and the two connect and multi-choice takes a small fee in connecting the two. The same is happening on the internet so at the, even now we are starting to offer movies on the internet at a fee in competition to Apple and Netflix and everyone else. So it's a contested vigorous field but quite an exciting field. Print, very briefly, uh, do you still sit on a Sunday morning with a, with a cup of tea and a <laughs> lot of newspapers spread in front of you because you like the tactile yeah. feel of the paper? I do, but you know the ominous thing is I was in New York a month ago and young people do not, educated, graduated young people do not sit with the New York Times, one of the most delightful papers in the world, in my view, mm. and a blueberry muffin on a Sunday morning. They actually get their information on devices. Yes. And it's interesting that um, News24, for example, is the biggest news site in the country, is already hitting two and a half million page views every day. I mean, how many newspapers get two and a half million sets of eyes across it every day? So I think the proportion of news and information conveyed by the internet 
will very quickly exceed that uh, printed on paper. Mm. But I think my generation will continue to read papers because that's how you grew up. So there's a type of legacy, latency element that'll keep papers going for quite a while. Mm. The problem is that young people grow up differently. 